You know that song, Imagine, by John Lennon? It's like he's painting this picture of a world without boundaries, right? And it really gets you thinking, what if we tried to dream even bigger, beyond just peace? Like, what about a future that's totally reshaped by AI? And I don't just mean robots and jobs and stuff, but like how we experience the world at like the most basic level. It's interesting you say that, because that's actually kind of what we're diving into today. We're going to be exploring some pretty fascinating stuff that you shared with me. Like, we've got a glimpse into AI researcher Sam Altman's vision of this intelligence age he talks about, and an academic paper about something called consent-based AI. And we're even going to jump into the future a bit with some excerpts from this fiction book about life with superintelligence. Wow, okay, so less Terminator, more like... Well, I guess we'll see. But um, yeah. you mentioned Sam Altman. What's the quick takeaway from that blog post of his? So he uses this really intriguing phrase, intelligence age. And he argues that we're already on the path. You know, yeah. he really dives into how AI, especially this thing called deep learning, mm -hmm. is starting to like really take off. It's essentially, you know, like teaching computers to learn on their own. They can analyze these massive amounts of data and then make decisions and predictions. Okay, so that's a lot of data. And that's where this whole consent based AI thing comes in, right? Like instead of picturing AI as this all powerful force that's just dictating our lives, this paper is saying it's more about us having a say in it. Yeah, exactly. It's about AI that adapts to our choices, both individually and as like whole communities even hold on consent based ai i'm picturing myself actually having to like give permission to my toaster before it can make my bagel in the morning what does that actually look like you know in practice well imagine being able to set very specific rules for how ai interacts with your everyday life right mm -hmm. like let's say you're someone who's really concerned about privacy you could choose to limit the data your ai assistant is allowed to collect but you'd still get to benefit from all those personalized recommendations. Or think about it on a larger scale. Whole communities could decide how AI is used in their public spaces, things like traffic management, resource allocation, that sort of thing. Okay, so it's less about like technology just happening to us and more about us actually having a say in how it's all woven into our lives. And I feel like this whole choice thing really comes into play in that fiction book you mentioned, right? Doesn't it throw us into this future where having a traditional job is almost unheard of because AI has just become so good at handling all those everyday tasks? It does. And that's where things get really interesting because, you know, you might be thinking, wait, no jobs. How does that even work? But that's the thing. This book doesn't focus on the negative parts of job displacement. Instead, it explores how this shift actually frees humans up to chase after passions and interests that they might not have had the time or resources for before. So no more Monday blues. I could get used to that. But seriously, what are people actually doing with all this extra free time? Give me some examples from the book. Oh, it paints such a vibrant picture, you know? Imagine artists collaborating with AI to make totally new art forms. Musicians writing these incredible symphonies with help from AI that can analyze and then synthesize entire genres of music. And space exploration. It's not just for astronauts anymore. In this book, basically anyone with a thirst for discovery can get in on that action. It's like that question everyone always asks, what would you do if you didn't have to work? Yeah. But like on a societal scale, you know? Exactly. And the book actually does a really clever job of connecting this whole idea back to something that academic paper also highlighted, which is this idea of shared prosperity. So if AI is the one creating all this abundance, how do we make sure that everyone benefits? That it's not just like a select few who get to reap all the rewards, because that feels like a huge question we're already, you know, dealing with even today. It is a huge question. And in this book's world, it's like their big challenge, you know, figuring out how to make this work for everyone. So it's not just about like taking the money we save and just like handing it out equally, right? It's got to be more about like fundamentally rethinking how we view work and our purpose and like how we decide what contributions are valuable to society, right? Exactly. It's tricky stuff. This book doesn't really give you easy answers, but it throws out some pretty thought-provoking scenarios. Like, there's this one community in the book that really emphasizes the importance of lifelong learning. They've got AI acting as these, like, personalized tutors, personalized mentors. It's like constant access to any knowledge, any skill you can imagine. I like that. Okay, so it sounds like the book does a good job of tackling those, like, huge societal questions, but also brings it back down to, like... 
everyday life. Which reminds me, in that blog post by Altman, remember how he talked about those personalized AI assistants? What's the book's take on those? Oh, they take that idea and just run with it, especially when it comes to food. Okay, stop. AI chefs now. Like, whipping up Michelin star meals delivered by drones. Uh, well, I mean, there is some pretty high-tech culinary magic going on, but it goes way beyond that even. The book describes these personalized food experiences. It's like, imagine art, but edible. You get these flavors tailored to exactly what you like, textures that change as you're eating, all curated by an AI that just know that your body wants, taste-wise, nutrition-wise, better than you even do. Whoa, okay, so less about replacing chefs and more like giving chefs these crazy new tools. Yeah, and it ties back into that consent thing, right? Like, if we're going to have AI woven into something as basic as food, it shouldn't just be about, like, maximum efficiency. It's got to be about making us feel good, making us enjoy it. Right, right. It's all got to be, like, actually enhancing our experience, not just making things faster or whatever. But it's not just food where this whole AI nature blend comes up in the book, is it? They also get into how AI could, like, actually help us save the planet, right? They do. And it's pretty refreshing, honestly. You know, we hear so much about AI in these, like, futuristic cities, and it's easy to picture, like, concrete jungles everywhere. But this book flips the script. Think about cities where buildings and forests are, like, seamlessly blended together. You've got vertical farms, so everyone's got access to local produce, uh, wildlife thriving right alongside humans, and AI systems are the ones making it all work, restoring balance to the whole ecosystem. Okay, so instead of concrete jungles, we get, what, AI-powered urban oases? I like yeah. the sound of that. Yeah, right. And it really highlights how AI could be this incredible force for good when it comes to the environment, not just managing what we have, but actually, like, healing the planet. Healing. That reminds me, there was this other part in the book, I think it was towards the end, that totally caught me off guard. Mm -hmm. Same thing about health optimization, but, like, for space travel. Oh, yeah. They talk about these AI systems that could actually adapt our physiology. Yeah. Like they, they'd gradually get your body used to different levels of gravity, different atmosphere. Hold on, are we talking about ditching the bulky spacesuits? Like our bodies would just, what, evolve on the fly? That's the thing about this book, you know? It takes these ideas that sound totally out there and makes you actually kind of want them. It makes you wonder, what else could we do with AI that seems impossible right now? It's almost like that personalized medicine thing, but like on steroids? Okay, whoa, <laughs> this is a lot. Before we go too far down this rabbit hole, though, can we circle back for a second to something you mentioned earlier? This whole bit about how even in this super efficient AI future, the British are still, like, waiting in line for stuff. Oh, yeah. Some traditions just never die, right? But it's such a good point. It's like, even if we could use AI to optimize like, every little thing, some things about being human, we just don't want to change. Right. It's not about erasing the past. It's about figuring out how all this new stuff fits with how we've always been. Like, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But with, like, robot baristas perfecting latte art while we wait in line. Which, speaking of how humans react to all this, there's one last thing from the book I wanted to touch on. There are these groups of people who just opt out, like, entirely. They want nothing to do with AI yeah. and just live off the grid, completely self-sufficient. Yeah. What's up with that? Is that even possible in this world they've built? It's a good question. And the book doesn't really give a solid yes or no. But the way it portrays these communities, it's not like they're anti-technology or anything. It's more like they're choosing to live by a different set of values, you know? They want that simplicity. They want that deep connection to nature. They want control, which I guess is hard to come by in a world run by algorithms. It's like, even if AI could give us all this amazing stuff, there's still that part of us that craves something simpler, something more, like, real, I guess. Right. And it loops us right back to consent-based AI. Just yep. because we can use AI for everything doesn't mean we should, you know. <laughs> We've got to be aware of different values, different comfort levels. The future can't just be one size fits all. It's less like, this is the future, everyone on board, yeah. and more like, this. we all get to kind of choose our own adventure. Exactly. And <laughs> that feels like a good place to maybe wrap things up. I don't know about you, but I need a minute to process all this. Me too. So, listeners, if your head is spinning right now, just remember, you're not alone. And more importantly, you have a say in all this. So don't just let the future happen to you. Read that book, ask some questions, and figure out what kind of worlds you want to help build. It's true. It's a lot to take in. But it's also, like, really exciting. Like, we have the chance to actually choose what our future looks like. It is. And it's not about having all the answers right now, you know. It's about being open to exploring those what-if questions. Right. Like, what if AI could actually help us fix climate change? 
or help us build a more fair and equal society. What if it could help us like unlock all this potential that we don't even know we have yet? Exactly. The possibilities really are limitless. And honestly, who knows? Maybe just by imagining these futures, by having these conversations, maybe that's how we take the first step towards making them real. I like that. So to wrap things up, I think the message is clear. The future of AI isn't something that just happens to us. It's something we get to create together. Absolutely. So keep asking those big questions, keep dreaming big, and most importantly, keep the conversation going.